I'm Ivana Hampton with Morningstar. Artificial intelligence is evolving pretty fast. It's reshaping how some of us think about getting our work done and maybe even raising concerns about the future of our jobs. Zach Cass is a futurist and former head of go-to-market at OpenAI. The company name likely sounds familiar because it developed the popular AI chatbot, ChatGPT. Thanks for being here, Zach. Thanks for having me. So you are a keynote speaker at this year's Morningstar Investment Conference in June. Folks will get to hear about artificial intelligence rapid evolution. You refer to yourself as an AI optimist. Let's start with what that means. Uh, well, look, I'll, I'll say this. I think that my view of the future is as rose colored as uh, as it gets in part because I studied history in college and get to observe as as many historians do that the world seems to just get better every day and and it's hard to argue that today is not the best day to be born ever and so i happen to view ai as a tool to accelerate this historical trend that humans have you know enjoyed for 100,000 years and my position is simply that it's not a question of will tomorrow be better than today it's will tomorrow be much better than today and can AI actually serve as a super linear accelerant on our on our progression? So stand with this idea of a much better tomorrow. What are the factors that could derail or slow down this optimistic future of AI? Yeah, well, uh, there are plenty. And I think let's also acknowledge that just because I refer to tomorrow as being better than today doesn't mean that we don't also get to observe some pretty tough patches and in the same way that you know you can't argue that the world wars didn't complicate life that you can't argue that the black plague didn't complicate life we can't argue that ai may not also complicate life and every generation pays some sacrifice it's not always clear what it is but it always it always plays out and i think two things could go pretty wrong um, as we start to see this progression of AI, the first is what I call identity displacement. And it's the theory that our jobs are going to change so frequently and so much that it's going to be very hard for people to actually attach their sense of self to their work, which has been a long standing tradition in this post industrial society. We'll talk more about that, I think, in a little bit. The second risk in all of this is idiocracy. My theory of idiocracy is simply that we might all just get dumber if we start to solve all of the discrete problems. And this is actually sort of playing out in some interesting ways already, which is we're observing some pretty strange patterns in the younger generation as they consume more and more social media. And it's becoming pretty clear, I think, to many of us that the iPhone, as much a benefit as it provided society, has actually led us into some pretty strange paths. And that namely is this massive decline in mental health and dehumanization that we see in these younger generations, right? That their standard deviation in many cases worse at social skills. Um, and this is really concerning on some short and medium term horizon. I don't actually worry about it on a long term horizon because we tend as humans to figure these things out. But the negative externalities of AI are going to play out. And the question is simply how quickly can we react to them and make sure that they don't affect multiple generations? And have you seen any sort of solutions where we could, could course correct quickly with these two so, problems? Yeah. So look, on, on identity displacement, we haven't even begun to understand what this might do to the population. And I think if you the, the closest comp that you can get to this is probably studying the luddites uh who are a class of people in the in the shortly after the first industrial revolution who decided that the um effect of the industrial revolution wasn't actually an economic burden it was a societal burden and they basically destroyed factories they did everything they could to slow technological progress and this is going to happen, I think, in droves in, in a whole new way because many people do not know how to extricate their sense of self from their work. And we've already observed this with Hollywood strikes, right? A class of people, quite honestly, that I don't actually think are immediately in danger of losing any sense of professional identity have already stood up and said, you cannot take away our inalienable right to be actors. 
And their concern is not an economic one. What they are not saying is we won't be able to work. What they are saying is we deserve a right to be actors. And I think the problem herein is that we don't yet appreciate how many of our jobs are going to change and how frequently they're going to change. And in order to evolve as a society, we may have to be willing, all of us, you, me, everyone may have to be willing to say, I'm okay economically, therefore I'm okay emotionally. And I, I stand by this because I really think AI is going to accelerate the humanistic elements of society. I think we are all eventually going to become much more human in this process. We're going to reduce the amount of computational work in our lives. And again, we can talk more about that in a second. But I don't think we actually know yet how to solve for this identity displacement crisis that we're facing. The best advice I can give to anyone is start considering how important your friends and family are to your happiness. Start considering all of the things in your life that you that make you you, that make you happy instead of your work. Because it may be very soon that you can no longer actually attach your happiness or your sense of self to your job. And as for idiocracy, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just saying that that could be seen as a way to encourage people to ease their concerns about how AI will come into their workplace, right? Certainly. I think, you know, when you ask people how much of their job do they like, and this is true for everyone, it's less than 50%. You know, up and down socioeconomic chain, anywhere in business, it's because we have so much computational cruft embedded into our lives, Right. What makes your job exciting is these moments on camera with me. And 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 there's so much that goes into your job that no one gets to see that honestly is a can can feel like a burden, I'm sure. I, I certainly feel the same way. I think we're gonna get rid of most of that work and actually end up enjoying the parts of our job that AI cannot do that we actually take the most pleasure in. It doesn't mean though that many jobs won't change a lot. And the sooner people start to appreciate that their work will get better and more productive even if it changes, I think the better will be. And well, AI technology promises to permeate nearly every aspect of life, which many can find threatening. Why should people trust the relative few who control this powerful technology to use it to serve all of humanity? Yeah, this is a great question. And I think two years ago, I wouldn't have had a great answer. Honestly, I would have said, look, you need to trust Microsoft and OpenAI. And for what it's worth, I do. Um, this is coming from someone who who uh, has just the most incredible experience at, at this company and can confidently say it's a business really trying to build a better future. That being said, it's also centralizing power in the world that we imagined a couple of years ago. That world is changing very quickly. And what we are observing now is that the open source models are actually catching up to the front, what we call frontier models, the, these closed source models that set the edge really quickly. And open source models that, you know, the acceleration of open source models basically indicates a ubiquity. And my prediction is actually ultimately that the research may commoditize, that the frontier model may not actually be the thing that wins the prize. And I'll talk more about that in a second, but ultimately my position here is that I think AI utilitizes, that it actually becomes a commodity in many cases and looks more like the internet or the electrical grid than it does the cloud. And so I don't actually tell people that you should put all your trust and faith into a single company because I don't think you actually have to anymore. What I think you have to do is challenge yourselves and the institutions around you to adopt this technology comfortably so that it can start to do things like make major scientific breakthroughs, in improve worker productivity and job satisfaction. Zach, can you describe how you have used AI to live a more human experience? Yeah. Uh, so this one I, I love to answer because, um, you know, I'm, I'm basically a small business owner now and I, I am a uh, writer. I'm an adjunct professor. I'm a keynote speaker. I'm a boardroom advisor. Um, and I do some research on the side. I would not be able to do these things. And by the way, there are plenty of people in my life who have encouraged me to do a little less, but notwithstanding the reasonable advice from friends and family, I would not be able to do any of these things were it not for the support of AI. And there are so many things in my life that have become 
simpler and easier because of things like the Zach GPT that I use that plugs into my email and helps me draft responses to the 200 emails I get a day. Um, helps me as a research assistant, helps me as a ghostwriter. Well, well, Zach, you can add me to the list of people who think you have a lot of jobs. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, thank I, you for this great conversation. I will see you at the Morningstar Investment Conference in June. Can't wait. Thanks so much for having me.